Hi everybody, today we're going to talk about DNA replication um, and because um, there's about 50 some slides I will again break down uh, the, video, uh, the lecture into several videos for ease of downloading and viewing. Um, DNA, DNA replication is a topic frequently covered in uh, molecular biology courses. I'm pretty sure you guys have covered it, it to some extent in introductory introduction to microbiology and maybe even in Life 1010. Um, however, it is such an important topic that it bears repeating, and especially since frequently classes do not cover eukaryotic DNA replication in, uh, to, in a great detail, mostly focusing on bacterial DNA replication. While bacterial DNA, DNA replication is absolutely essential to understand, and it's a little bit easier to understand than eukaryotic replication, which takes, which takes a few more steps, um, um, Today's lecture will primarily focus on eukaryotic replication. Now, DNA replication is an important topic, uh, both for understanding how anti-cancer treatments are designed and for understanding how mu much of the molecular biology technology works, things such as PCR, um, sequencing, etc. Because the enzymes used for, the, for these techniques are the enzymes that actually participate in, in DNA replication of a cell's DNA. Now, DNA replication is a complex process that occurs exactly once in a cell's life. A cell will only duplicate its DNA once right before it's ready to divide. It will duplicate its DNA during the S phase and then get ready for mitosis when division will occur. Um, and uh, just to point out, you don't need to memorize the names of these drugs. I will not ask you guys, but for you, so you guys can appreciate the importance. Here is the basic representation of a DNA replication fork uh, with the big blue blob being the polymerase um, and the many drugs that have been designed against the various steps of DNA replication. For example, uh, flu fluorouracil as well as methotrexate are one of the oldest anti-cancer treatments available um, and they block the production, these drugs block the production of DNTPs, specifically thymidine. Thymidine is uh, only used in DNA and never used in RNA, so it's only produced in great quantities when DNA is about to be replicated. Um, uh, the various polymerases, um, drugs designed against the polymerases, are one of the are, are the many uh, antiviral treatments that are used because many DNA viruses have very particular DNA polymerases that are significantly different from um, eukaryotic DNA polymerases that a drug can be designed to inhibit the viral DNA polymerase and not affect the eukaryotic DNA polymerase. So a cyclovir, uh, gemcitabine, gencyclovir, all the these new viral drugs are poly targeting polymerases. I'm not going to go through the rest of them, but you can appreciate it. Also, something that I didn't know is that caffeine inhibits DNA replication. So how much DNA do we exactly have per cell? If you do, there's some basic math on the slide here, and you can uh, appreciate here that uh, since we have six uh, 6 billion base pairs approximately inside our genome that amounts to 2.2 meters or about 3 yards of DNA per cell. Now we have about 2 times 10 to the 13th cell in per human. So if we were to take right now all the DNA that your body contains and line it up one after another, um, one would one would create a strand that was long enough to have 70 trips, round trips between Earth and the Sun. It is a fantastic amount of DNA. And all of this DNA was produced using DNA replication. And every time a cell divides, it needs to not just copy all of this DNA that it contains, but it needs to make an exact copy or a nearly exact copy to avoid the various mutations that will send it down a course of uh, cell death, such as apoptosis or necrosis, or worse, will send it down the road to cancer. Now, our body has about 5 to the 9th division 
um, per um, cell, cell divisions per day, and that's not counting the red blood cells. Um, so let's first look, uh, before we look how DNA is replicated, let's look how cells divide. Um, I had encouraged you guys earlier to look at the, the cell cycle um, review that you guys have in chapter two of the book. Um, um, you're welcome to look through it just to be sure that you understand the concepts because I think they're important. Um, but as you can see here, the interface chromosomes of a, of a normal um, quiescent cell that's just doing its job but not planning on dividing, um, just hang out in the nucleus. Uh, when uh, the cell switches, it makes a decision that it's time to divide, it enters G1 phase when it prepares itself for first DNA replication. Um, and during the S phase, the DNA synthesis phase, the cell will replicate all of its DNA content and now instead of um, a single chromatin, you will have two sister chromatids attached to each other. And this is your typical X that you associate the shape of the chromosome with. It's, that's the diploid chromosomes uh, of, the, of, of, of a mitotic cell. Now, the, during S phase, the chromosomes are still not condensed. They're still these really complicated snarls. Um, and only during the G2 and in the M phase, the chromosomes that had been condensed and then lined up on the mitotic plate will be segregated into two parts of the cell, and then a wall will be built in, in the middle, and two cells in the cell will divide it into two daughter cells, each containing one copy of the sister chromatids it had just divided, it just duplicated in the S phase. If you look at the approximate error rate of the human DNA replication, it's a pro a approximately one in 10 billion. So one in 10 billion, uh, billion um, nucleotides inserted, the DNA polymerase will make a mistake that it cannot repair. That it missed, it had moved on, and the mistake stays there in the new DNA. Um, so that's less than one mistake per replication cycle of, of the cell. But it also allows you to appreciate that since we have 10 to the 13th cell um, in, in our body, the, 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 DNA, uh, the DNA polymerase has made um, 5 to the 10 to the 12th mistakes already in our DNA. And it's other, um, and those cells, if the mutation was deleterious, those cells most likely died, or they have been cleared out in one way or the other. So imagine trying to make something, to make a process 6.4 billion times without making a mistake. How is it that DNA replication is so carefully controlled? Uh, well, before we talk about the proteins that do the job, let's talk about how the realization came, how DNA is replicated. When Watson, and, when Watson and Crick proposed their structure of DNA, they also proposed, based on what they saw that the DNA structure was, they postulated that uh, a copying mechanism, a semi-conservative copying mechanism was possible. So the idea was that the double helix could be separated into two. So, and then one of the strands could, is, could be served as a template to uh, create a new double, a new um, DNA strand on top of it using the DNA, previously existing DNA helix as a template. Now, uh, that is called semi-conservative DNA replication. As you can see here, if you start with the blue DNA strand and you somehow divide the DNA into two sister, into two single strands, then uh, something would come in and fill in the DNA based on the, um, the blue that would fill in the red, uh, based on the blue blueprint um, in the first generation. And then in the second generation, uh, when, these, uh, when each of these DNA strands became separate cells, and now these two cells are making four cells, you would see that uh, uh, slowly but surely the original blue content is diluted and the previously um, synthesized red DNA strands are now used as templates. 
Um, the implications of this uh, model is that the individual strands of the DNA are, remain intact and that um, the newly produced DNA are hybrids between the old and the new. Um, now, how could uh, Watson and Crick or somebody else prove it? Because not everybody believed the semi-conservative model. Um, other models were also proposed. Um, so the, other, the reason other models were proposed, so semi, uh, Watson and Crick were proposing the semi-conservative model. So this is here. Um, but um, uh, scientists were worried that this model was unlikely because they couldn't see how, at room temperature, the, the base pairing, the very tight base pairing of the hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA could be separated um, if the DNA helix was so completely twisted together. So um, two other potential models were proposed. Um, the conservative model was proposed saying that the DNA structure during replication remains intact and somehow the new DNA molecule is read off from the side from the old blue DNA molecule, allow, um, showing that um, in the second generation, as more DNA is, uh, is produced, the old stra uh, strand still remains intact. Um, other people's, people propose a dispersive model, suggesting that during DNA replication, the DNA is chopped into little bits um, that can be easily unwound, and um, then they are spliced together to make the new DNA. And uh, the new DNA is a sort of patchwork of the old blue DNA and the new red. So to prove uh, or to investigate all these three models, two scientists in the United States Messelson and Stahl, in 1958, developed a very lovely experiment um, to, to, to ask this question. So the idea was that, just like in this picture, the DNA is labeled in blue and red, if one could label the real DNA in blue and red, one would be able to uh, follow the DNA as the self divide and figure out what one would observe where the DNA, this, uh, the, um, after two generations of cell divisions, the DNA strands would look like that, uh, like this, or all mixed and mashed together as in the dispersive model. So the way they decided to label the cells is using radioactivity. Now you can add a heavy nitrogen 15 to the DNA because DNA contains a lot of nitrogen in its base pairs. And you can grow um, bacteria on a source uh, that only contained uh, a nitrogen-15 DNA source, and then compare them to the bacteria that only contained the nitrogen-14 source, which is the typical light nitrogen. Uh, and again, by nitrogen, well, you can count yourself how many nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five nitrogens are just in adenine. Um, and since uh, dideoxia, um, Sorry, and since deoxynucleotides are made specifically in G1 phase uh, in large quantities in order to uh, duplicate the DNA, um, it was easy to feed the cells nitrogen before they were allowed to divide. And then the next step was to um, separate the DNA that was heavy and full of the heavy 15 nitrogen from the light DNA, and this was done using high-speed centrifugation, aka you spin something extremely fast. Um, but it wasn't just a simple solution of water that the DNA was suspended with. A very careful gradient of cesium chloride, different cesium chloride concentrations was poured. Um, and um, the, as the centrifuge, ultra-centrifuge spun really, really fast, um, the heavier DNA that was full of nitrogen-15 would run at the, would move much, much, um, um, much lower down the cesium chloride gradient, and so the cesium chloride gradient here is in light yellow, than the lighter N14 DNA. And um, you would get, so you, again, you see here that the light yellow, you can see how it's a little bit lighter here and a little bit darker here, and this is a cesium chloride gradient. 
and the blue band of the heavy DNA runs at this length, and the blue uh, cyan band of the light DNA will run at this length after a certain amount of 48 hours of centrifugation. Um, and as a result, then, since this is already activity, you can then expose the tubes to, um, uh, to film, and radioactivity will turn certain parts of the film dark, allowing you to know exactly with how much light versus heavy DNA you got. And if you're curious about uh, how cesium chloride gradient is poured and how this is all done, I'm not going to ever test this on a quiz. This is a little bit higher order. Um, you're welcome to go to this link and educate yourself. It's a, still a very common technique in biology uh, to separate various biomolecules uh, using gradients and ultracentrifugation. And the question becomes like, what well, if you just needed to separate this based on, you just needed to separate the DNA, why didn't they just run uh, the gel? Well, even though the weight, the density of the DNA differs between the uh, bacterial cells that uh, were growing on the radioactive heavy N15 and not radioactive light N14, the length of the DNA should be the same. There was no differences there. So these bands would actually run exactly the same height on a gel. Now, the experiment one that Mendelssohn and Stahl did was to grow cells in heavy medium and then switch to light medium for one complete round of DNA replication. So they first made the blue heavy cells and then gave the cells one round of replication to make the light red cells and then tried to see what, uh, which of the, which of the, what, what they observed and which of the, of which of the models um, that they were testing would able to predict this outcome. So this is what the different models would propose for the first round of replication. The conservative model would propose, since the conservative model proposes that the heavy strand is never separated and it always stays together, and somehow magically the light strand or the red strand is going to be made from it, uh, you would see two, <coughs> two bands, um, the light DNA band and the heavy DNA band, which represents the red and the blue DNA strands on the picture. The semi-conservative method proposed a mixed population, both light and heavy, because it's proposed that the blue DNA is serving as a template and 50% of each of the new produced DNA molecules would be old heavy DNA and 50% would be later uh, new DNA. And then since dispersive model was proposing chopping up the parental blue strand into many different pieces and then unwinding them and then splicing it all back together um, uh, as a little patchwork quilt, um, the first generation of the dispersive model also predicted that uh, what you would see would be a mix of light and heavy bands and you would not see this very clear separation of light and heavy bands. So what did Mendelssohn, Mendelssohn and Stahl observe? Well, when uh, they um, looked at their results, they got a mixed population, which um, suggested, which ruled out the conservative model, since uh, the, what conservative model was predicting did not match the results. But which of the other two models, semi-conservative or dispersive, dispersive, was it now? Um, and how could they rule it out? Now, they also did another experiment. Instead of just um, using the um, cesium, typical cesium chloride gradient, they uh, created the cesium chloride gradient in an alkaline environment. And uh, if you remember from the DNA structure lecture, the DNA uh, base pairs can be, uh, the base pairing between the D two DNA strands can be broken down by heat or by an alkaline and acidic environment because the, the environment um, occupies the hydrogen bonds and prevents the hydrogen, the base pairs from matching up. So since, um, so, um, uh, sorry. So if um, the semi-conservative model was predicting that the, even though the 
uh, DNA strands were mixed together, um, the, par the parental blue strand and the new red strand uh, would run together in a normal environment because they had base paired to each other. Uh, they, it also proposed that the whole parental strand, which serves as a template, would stay intact, and then uh, the entire new strand would, would, be, would be made out of the new DNA, uh, using new DNA synthesis. As a result, if this double helix is placed into a denaturing environment and separated into two daughter strands, it can now um, be separated by centrifugation to the light new DNA, in the heavy old one. While the dispersive model is predicting this patchwork of um, red and blue on the same strand, so when the base pair ring was broken, the strands would still run as mixed, um, since part of each DNA molecule was old and part of it was new. And as you just saw, when they ran their um, new DNA, in, when they run their DNA in an alkaline environment, denaturing environment, uh, then, the, uh, then um, the scientist observed a band for light and a band for heavy, uh, ruling out that the dispersive model was correct as well. Now, uh, additional proof from the, for the semi-conservative DNA replication model came from uh, gradients ran from the second generation where the bacteria were allowed to divide in the light medium, light nitrogen containing medium twice. Um, and um, uh, the prediction here was that the semi-conservative model, you would have half of the DNA would be completely light. As you remember, there's, uh, there's two red uh, chromosomes that are replicated from the second generation templates and then half of the DNA was mixed, which is the old DNA from the first replication. And this is exactly what they observed. So you can see here that the reason this is light and this is mixed is because these two are mixed and these two are completely light because they only were incorporating light nitrogen when they were divided. So this ruled out this series of experiments really beautifully ruled out the conservative and the dispersive models of DNA replication and, and showed that semi-conservative model was likely the only answer. So again, semi-conservative means that the, DNAs, uh, the two DNA strands are split apart somehow, and then that each single strand serves as a template for the new generation of DNA uh, molecules, creating exact double-stranded copies. And this is the actual paper that was pu uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science back in 1958 by Matt Ma Ma Messelson and Frank Stahl. And the reaction from uh, the Watson and Crick was understandable. And you can see how fast this was done. Mes Messelson and Stahl published their paper in 1958, and it was only um, five years previously that Crick and Watson report, reported their structure of DNA model. And of course, Watson said, I told you so, and so did Crick, but in a more polite British ma manner. And uh, just to show how little Franklin uh, was able to contribute to the DNA, um, to the DNA revolution that was occurring at the time in molecular biology, Rosalind was already dead. She never saw the paper. She had. Uh, died three months earlier from ovarian cancer.